Okay, everyone. Hello and welcome to this webinar. Um, well, the webinar, we are calling it the circular economy or vicious cycle uh, in regards to the new report that we recently launched on corporate, corporate capture as a driver of deforestation. Some uh, housekeeping about the Zoom, where you're having interpretation, there are rooms for interpretation on English, French, Portuguese, and Spanish. You'll find that uh, below on the right hand side, it's like a, a rounded icon, then you can use it. If you don't need it, you can switch it off. Um, and yeah, so we can start now uh, officially with the webinar. So welcome everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to people uh, coming to this uh, webinar today. Uh, as I just mentioned, this webinar is based on our most recent publication of forest cover, number 63. And we focus this time on corporate capture as a driver of deforestation. Uh, in the report, as well as in the presentations, you come up uh, with issues that are addressed such as corporate lobbies, greenwashing, incentives and subsidies, conflicts of interest, the transfer of public resources to private companies, blended finance, corporate capture as an obstacle to multilateral environmental agreements, redirecting funding and reforming incentives among others. Cor corporate capture is basically the influence of companies and public institutions using strategies that manipulate those in government institutions and public institutions, which undermine all acquired multilateral commitments. This publication has a focus on unsustainable livestock production, tree plantations, and bioenergy. And it looks at examples that reinforce the cycle of corporate capture of, poli of policy making and the perverse incentives uh, given to, har to harmful industries. This uh, report includes analysis of member groups and close allies in nine different countries. For the webinar, we will just have four of the cases, uh, the rest of the cases, you can look them up in the publication that's already up on the GFC website. It's also translated into the same languages that we are providing today. Uh, the examples are from the different regions in Latin America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. And they show how entrenched these incentives are due to the corporate capture of decision-making at national, regional, and international level. The report starts by looking at the dynamics emerging from the diverse ways of incentivizing a sustainable livestock sector, which is responsible for further deforestation, the greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity loss, and violations of human rights. Um, as I mentioned before, there's uh, different regions, the livestock uh, uh, articles are um, located in Argentina, in Brazil, in Paraguay, in Nepal, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and the regional case uh, is geared towards the European Union. Going beyond the livestock sector, the, reports also, the report also looks at the influence of the pulp and paper industry over decision making in Portugal and its relation to Mozambique. And in the UK, how it shows how intense lobbying by owners of one of the world's largest biomass plants, biomass power stations, uh, guaranteed huge subsidies for many years to come. And even the capture of global policy making is addressed in this report that um, the, that some financial mechanisms are being destined to commercial tree plantations, bioenergy, and other false solutions that continue to fuel the climate and the biodiversity crisis. Uh, in the report, you'll find a very interesting introduction done by our, our ED, Simon Lovera, uh, on forest finance and perverse partnerships. She'll give some words for conclusions after we finish with the presentations. There are three key important points to rescue from this introduction. Uh, one is that forest conservation and restoration do not depend on money. 
uh, that the community conservation resilience assessments that the G Global Forest Coalition concluded in 2019, after a four-year process, uh, it looked that um, that the recognition of forest governance rights, the role, the respect of the role for indigenous peoples, local communities, and women, and forest conservation, and the provision of affordable public services are were way more important than financial investments themselves. And number three is the recognition that perverse incentives in the form of subsidies and other economic incentives for sectors that trigger deforestation are actually uh, present and uh, haven't been tackled. One example is the IH target number, number three on the Convention on Biological Diversity. That is one of the targets that aimed at, uh, at tackling perverse incentives that show the least progress after the 10-year te the framework, strategic framework of the CBD that concluded last year in 2020. Uh, just briefly, uh, some of the articles uh, included in this publication, one is from Argentina on the brink, uh, showing how subsidies, either national and local subsidies from the state supported the industrial and feedstock uh, farming sector, uh, destroying wetlands. There is an initiative from the government for 200 million tons of grains, oilseeds and pulses, that implies that expansion goes broader than just forests, what we knew, but also moving to wetlands and very important wetlands ecosystems in the Grand Chaco that are completely devastating the region and the ecosystem. And this is because of intense lobbying and the governments and in creating initiatives and plans for this to happen. Uh, the livestock farming and privilege in Paraguay, destruction and injustice. This is uh, one of the other articles. Um, and it shows how since the very founding uh, of, of the democracy and the country, perverse incentives were provided to the livestock sector. And those led to a 90% of land privatization and left 80% of the land on 2% of the population. And this has come at the expense, of course, of, uh, of social welfare for Paraguay's inhabitants. There's even evidence of the GEF supporting uh, livestock expansion in the Paraguayan Chaco. Uh, another article we have is in South Kivu, the Democratic Republic of Congo, showing also corruption, poor governance, and a brutal disregard for human rights. And it points at the fact that a lot of the people uh, serving politicians or re retired politicians are also direct shareholders of uh, agropastoral businesses. Therefore, a lot of uh, policies support these businesses and allow for further expansion. And they even grant land concessions and forest concessions to these companies at the expense of local peoples. And this is not, the, not very different from, from what happens in Nepal. Uh, we have an article on incentives for, for intensive animal agriculture, agriculture that clash with forest protection in Nepal. And this actually is a very interesting case because it's, uh, it's uh, the conflicting policies between the expansion of uh, animal agriculture versus the Forests Act that has been going on for a while and has shown in the past good uh, results. Um, the main point here is that smallholders and poor landless farmers cannot benefit from any of the support due a lot of a, a lack of access of information to the government's programs a lack of means to form companies and a lack of capital to cover costs that are partially subsidized because most of the subsidies go to larger initiatives. Then, uh, and for this webinar, we will have Maurice, Maureen Santos from FASE in Brazil presenting on perverse incentives for agroindustry in Brazil. So I'll give the floor to Maureen. After Maureen, we'll have Nina Holland from Corporate Europe Observatory in Belgium, 
she's going to talk about how EU agribusiness frustrated the reform of the most perverse incentive of all, which is the common agricultural policy. So I now give the floor to Maureen and then to Nina. Thanks. Thank you, Isis. Um, and thank you, everybody. And it's a very pleasure to be with you. And if we, I thank you for the invitation for Global Forest Coalition. Uh, I prefer to speak Portuguese, so the less of my presentation will be in Portuguese. Uh, I have some screen share to. to no, pardon. Eu tenho algumas é, uns slides para compartilhar, mas antes de compartilhar bem. But before that, uh, very fast, I will speak about the perverse incentives at the agroindustrial chain in Brazil in the last years and how we perceive the social social environmental impacts of this sector and the relation of this sector and incentives with process political processes in Brazil in the last years years especially in the last two years with Bolsonaro administration Is it working? Is it? Let me click here. Is it full screen or not? Sorry, it's not working here in my presentation. Well, so I would like to speak about three points. The first one is the relation with this chain. Uh, what's the status of the of this chain in Brazilian? When we speak about livestock in Brazil, we speak on 2015 million of uh, cattle, the second uh, large amount of cattle in the world, more than the Brazilian population, and it occupies 350 million hectares. So it's a very strong sector in Brazil. At the same time, it's totally associated to the soy complex, where this, the commodities, the Brazilian commodities are 43% of Brazilian exportations together with other agricultural sectors. And it grew 140% in the last 20 years. We perceive that this growth is associated to profound investments from the public sector, also from the private sector at national and international levels. And the scale of that is proportional to the scale of the social environmental conflicts and also environmental destruction and the growing impacts on climate crisis. Let me see if you can see here. In the report we published, we described a little what those incentives represent for the sector. Here you can see some international investors, like the BlackRock from the United States, and the Association of Indigenous Peoples in Brazil just pointed out in a report the conflicts with the indigenous lands in Brazil creating a series of other conflicts. The BlackRock invested a lot. Uh, the, the, first, the three main groups from Brazil as the JBS. Here you can see the amounts. 3.7 billion, so it's a lot. And through the National Bank of Development, they finance a lot of projects. There are two groups very important to strengthen that perverse incentives, like the BNDE. Here you can see the values, the amounts, and also the Bank of Brazil that support agribusiness through the rural credit. From 2012, uh, a lot of billion from the livestock sector. A recent research that was published right after we published our report 
uh, point out some key elements from this chain in Brazil. From 2013 to 2020, so part of this, 74% uh, of this value is through the Banco Brasil. From 2012, it was 80 million to the agricultural sector for soy and other commodities from Brazil and in other international institutions that are supporting a lot of those incentives. We have a very important group with a huge power in this administration, but actually they are in the power for a lot of time. They are called the Centrão, and it's related to a part of the Bancada Ruralista in the, in the Congress, which is financed through several international organizations that are financed also uh, from international organizations as Cargill, Europharma, and other companies like Syngenta and other international corporations. I will make available this data that were compiled through by journalists monitoring ruralists. There's a deep relation among this sector and deforestation in Amazon areas and also in the Cerrado and also in the Pantanal and the forest burnt in forest fires in the Pantanal already disappeared a part of this, of the Pantanal region. And there are data, data talking about deforestation in protected areas associated to indigenous lands and also in protected areas in state and federal level. The, in the last years in those areas, the deforestation grew 90%. And the trends are worse and worse because this sector is in power right now in the administration and they are profounding the deregulation of the environmental legislation and also the social protection of people. So this is a very difficult moment that we are living and we are creating strategies to look for at the same time uh, ways to combine resistance from, this sec from some sectors as quilombolas and indigenous peoples, and also uh, create strategies of pressure in the Senate and the chamber to improve this, the Brazilian system. I thank you very much. And if you want to ask questions, you can ask. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, please let me remind people that there's a room for interpretation on the rounded icon down below on the right. Also, if you want to ask questions, there's a Q&A box. Please make sure you ask your questions through the Q&A box. And uh, to the panelists, please remember to speak slowly to allow some time for the interpreters. And now we'll go with Nina Holland from Corporate Europe or Observatory in Belgium. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll try to speak slowly. Um, thanks very much for inviting me and for inviting me as well to participate uh, to the report. Um, just uh, as a way of introduction, uh, CEO is a, like a lobby watchdog organization and we do research on corporate capture, uh, specifically at the EU political institutions, but also at other levels. And uh, we also do political campaigning, trying to roll back the corporate capture. And this year, uh, I would like to mention two reports that we published uh, on the main single biggest budgets of the EU, the research subsidies and the agricultural subsidies. I will talk 
mostly about the, the last ones. But I also think that the first one is called uh, Research and Destroy. Uh, is particularly relevant here because it gives a picture how reverse incentives are being given to research projects. So this is public money to develop technologies for biomass uh, to be turned into all sorts of uh, all sorts of products without addressing any of the social issues or any of the environmental costs associated with them. But secondly, uh, and that is the issue here, we published a report on the capture by the big farm chemical and food lobbies of the common agricultural policy or the CAP. Uh, each five years, the CAP is being renegotiated and basically it lays uh, hands on around one third of the EU budget. So this is right now almost 400 billion euros. Uh, so this is about massive amount of money and therefore attracts always uh, an incredibly inc incredible amount of, of lobbying. You will probably be all aware that the existing CAP for decades has been supporting a farming system that is both socially and environmentally broken. It has subsidized overproduction. It has subsidized export to countries in the global south, destroying local markets. It has subsidized the production of, of scale, of ever more intensification of production, which of course has led to the increased imports of the raw materials that were needed, like soy. Still, still now, even though not all of those things are still being subsidized, still now, it favors those farmers who have the largest amounts of land. So the big landowners still benefit most from the cap because most of the money is distributed per hectare. So the more land you have, the more money you will get. An estimated 80% of all subsidies handed out end up with 20% of the producers in the EU. And uh, around 30 billion per year end up uh, as direct payments for land that feeds livestock. So the livestock industry is a, still a big beneficiary also uh, of this money. So in a sense, the CAP has become a subsidy just to support the EU-based food industry competitiveness because the farmers themselves are largely not benefiting. They have become completely dependent on the CAP to stay out of bankruptcy uh, because all their markets have been one by one liberalized. The prices have dropped and so now they need the subsidies just to stay uh, in business. In Central and Eastern Europe we see that the farm subsidies have even fueled authoritarian regimes and I'm talking mostly uh, notably of, of Hungary and the Czech Republic. So in October this year um, it was a key moment for the new cup for 2021 to 2027. Um, this proposal was made in 2018 so it had already been discussed for a number of years and every expert opinion had already said that it wasn't green enough and not fair enough meaning uh, it doesn't deliver for biodiversity, the green measures weren't strong enough, and it was also not doing anything about the fact that some recipients like the Queen of England or other nobility big landowners were still, would still get big financial handouts uh, from public resources. In early October, there was a vote and there were no improvements uh, to environmental or climate protections. For instance, all proposal to cut subsidies for factory farming were, re were rejected. Um, and an ambitious proposal to also distribute the money more fairly was also rejected. So the money, the result is that the money will keep fueling a damaging production system and that will also keep making smaller farms disappear. Now, it will not surprise you what was behind it. Uh, the CAP has always been um, an incredibly difficult topic to work on and to try to change because of all the entrenched interests. Um, 
there has been really a close network of interest that has blocked any change. Um, it is, of course, not just a matter of industry pushing into one direction. It is also very much the public institutions inviting them to come and give their opinion and give them privileged access. And this is notably a network of uh, ministers of agriculture, the people working in DG agriculture, that is part of the European Commission that drafts the legislation, and then the agriculture committee in the European Parliament. So everyone to deal with agriculture uh, in the institutions in, la in the large majority is very like-minded and ha they have since long teamed up with the big farm lobby group, Copa Cosica. Uh, that is the, the name of the uh, lo big, lo big farm lobby in the EU and a wide uh, array of food and agribusiness uh, corporate lobby groups. So the first problem you will already see uh, is in the name Copa Cosheca. It's actually a double organization. Copa is the farmers and Cosheca is large farmer cooperatives that used to be farmer owned cooperatives, but now are themselves big multinationals. They include Rabobank. They include Friesland Campina, a huge dairy corporation. So Cogeca, the cooperatives are aggressively pro-free trade and they definitely have politically the upper hand over the farmer part COPA. They also have close liaisons with uh, the pesticide firms. Um, and as I said, they really get privileged access to the institutions. For instance, when the European ministers meet, just before that, Copa Cosheca will always have a private meeting with whoever is then chairing the meeting of the day. So who has the EU presidency? So this is not being granted, of course, to any other organization, let alone uh, an NGO or a movement. Uh, it is only granted to Copa Cosheca. It is also reflected in the expert groups that advise the commission. For instance, the one on milk is dominated for over like three quarters of the seats um, are occupied by Copa Cosheca or and by industry. So this also shows uh, that the this whole system is just made to keep the same uh, system of production and the same um, uh, political and, and ideological uh, system in place. Copa Cosheca even lobbied against a mandatory cap on the subsidy, so a, a maximum. So in order to keep the richest uh, big landowners from getting too much money. So they even uh, argued against that. So they are clearly just lobbying for say the 10% biggest farmers, the 20% biggest farmers rather than for the rest. Um, at the same time, uh, there is a new European commission that launched a, a European Green Deal. Uh, attached to that is a farm to fork strategy with um, many new uh, ambitions uh, and promises to change the way that we produce, consume, trade, restore ecosystems uh, with references also to livestock, to um, soy imports that lead to deforestation, etc. Of course, this, these new strategies have come immediately under heavy attack from Copa Cosheca, also internally from DG Agriculture, also from the pesticide firms, because for the first time, actual pesticide reduction targets were introduced in that strategy, 50% in 10 years, um, also 50% uh, reduction in anti antimicrobial use, things like that. It's quite substantial uh, and a 20, uh, 25% of EU farmland should be under organic production also in 10 years, uh, which would be a tripling from now. So all of those things sound very nice, um, but are heavily under attack and um, um, has now become also much less feasible financially because of the cup, all that public money that should have steered production and farmers practices towards a more sustainable and a more fair and a more localized system, all of that money is now going to business as usual. Uh, so that means that uh, the farm to fork strategy and the biodiversity strategy have much less chance actually to succeed. Um, there has been a huge amount of indignation 
uh, after this vote and also after uh, the, the following negotiations that are all held behind closed doors in secret. Um, and uh, this indignation is, uh, was mainly driven by uh, the young people of Youth for Climate and Fridays for, uh, for Future. Uh, they really jumped on this issue, made it incredibly uh, visible, much more visible than it ever was before. Um, we also did our share by organizing uh, a corona proof action of which I will show uh, a picture um, in which we really wanted to break with the uh, bit with the, the, the Brussels way of doing things, always, you know, having some politeness in, uh, uh, in, in, in diplomatic uh, communication with everyone. And we basically singled out the, the worst MEPs uh, that were responsible for this really awful degradation and uh, shameful compromise that they had made, really even worsening than what the commission proposed. Um, and they really uh, didn't appreciate that. They were really very, very angry. We did a lot of social media with these pictures um, to really call them out and make them uh, personally visible. Because at that point, it just felt like the only thing uh, we, could, we could do. I would like to end here and um, uh, it is not yet finished. Uh, let's, let's end on a positive note. We are also still very much preparing to fight for the promises that were made on pesticide reduction, but also of uh, uh, lands. Of course, we want a lot more and we will definitely, I mean, in the past, uh, we worked a lot with Global Forest Coalition and others to, uh, to stop the, uh, the greenwash exercises around so-called sustainable soy and zero deforestation soy, which of course is uh, a lot of nonsense. Um, but uh, that has been postponed a little bit into the, into the future. But um, yeah, it is it's still not finished and we will still try to very much work from other directions, trying to uh, improve a bit the, the situation. I'm very uh, eager also to hear all the rest of the stories. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, we have a couple of questions for you and a request. Uh, you talked about a report in the beginning, a couple of reports. Someone is asking if you could paste the links to the report on the chat box. Sure, I will do that. And there is another question about how Copa Corega will align with the EU Green Deal policy. It is completely undermining the Green Deal. Uh, it is uh, under the radar. It is it is attacking and lobbying against uh, the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork. We have now uh, obtained the, their lobby, their amendments that they are making now uh, to the Farm to Fork. And they basically want the members of the European Parliament to remove any reference to any damage done by agriculture to the climate. So they don't even want to hear about it. Um, so this, this shows their very extreme position and uh, extremely backward position as well. Um, so they are really uh, going to try to um, uh, twist it and uh, especially avoid any sort of targets that will really force them to change uh, the, to change production, like much less fertilizer use, much less antimicrobial use. It sounds like maybe very technical things, but they, if that is really implemented, that will really force them uh, to start pr producing in a very different way. And um, yeah. Thank I see you, another, Nina. Have, yeah, sorry? let's go on. No, we have one more question before we continue to the second part of this webinar. So someone saying, thank you for an excellent presentation. How much of the European Green Deal is focused on afforestation and reforestation issues? Um, uh, a part, I, can't, I can't say how much of it is. Uh, I wouldn't be able to, uh, to say 
uh, to put a number on that or, or something like that. Um, but the, the biodiversity strategy definitely is uh, focused on um, on um, the quality of, of biodiversity in Europe, but there is really also a strong international aspect. They have promised to make imports more sustainable and therefore try to, um, uh, to avoid products that have a strong environmental damage done elsewhere. Of course, uh, that sounds maybe like already some greenwash, but uh, any, this is already quite new because in international trade um, to judge imports based on their environmental damage done elsewhere is already uh, something that that will sound very radical and it will bump into a lot of problems in the WTO. But this is something where we're really pushing them uh, that they need to uh, actually put action where in, instead of just uh, having nice words. Thanks, Nina. One last question for you, then we'll move to a question for Maureen. Uh, Michael is asking, does the envisaged EU Mercosur Treaty has an impact on the reduction of subsidies, for example, with CAP as well as in, for example, Brazil? Am I right that the treaty will continue to allow the subsidies on both sides? Anyway, in the EU, uh, this, this new system has now been agreed so this new system is until 27, and uh, there is no, there is so there's no way that EU Mercosur will reduce that. I don't know what it will mean in the long term, but I don't think it will. I don't think that that particular deal will have an immediate impact on uh, on the subsidies in the future. But I'm not aware of it. Okay, Nina, thank you so much. Uh, then a question for Maureen. Maureen, could you give just a little bit more explanation on the influence of Banca Bancada Ruralista? Okay. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Mercosul um, Thing that was just mentioned. The Bancada Ruralista is a front, a parliamental front in the Brazilian Congress that most of the congressmen are connecting to what we call the agribusiness sector. Most of this front is made by a permanent group called Frente Parlamentar Agropecuária, which is the one that I showed previously in one of the slides of those who influence in the agriculture. It's a very dynamic front. The current Minister of Agriculture, she is the president of that front um, until at least uh, at the end of 2018, uh, when she was um, invited to be Minister of Agriculture. And most of their financing comes from the production sector of chemicals for agriculture, like agrotoxic, agrotoxins. So the data that have been compiled, they show that these fronts and the, the making of pesticides are being financed by this front. It's not only a federal front, it is in all the states and state, uh, state congressmen are also in this front. A uh, comment about Mercosul and the cap incentives. There's nothing being signed for it to end, but as this has been happening, the agribusiness sector has been uh, enhanced and the list of goods has been enhanced with the Brazilian commodities. The impact will make things even worse. And the local discussion, like the cuts in um, how much meat that has been produced. So the quotes for this in the meat sector uh, are reduced 
as well as the, the feedings and the soy and the elimination of agriculture related to agrotoxins. And this causes a lot more preoccupation because Brazil has been champion uh, in the use of agrotoxics and the fast release of these. And especially during Bolsonaro's government, uh, more than 900 agrotoxic ingredients have been released within the last two years. And that's a lot. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Marine. Thank you so much, Nina. We will now continue to the second part of the webinar that is going to address the pulp and paper industry problems with corporate capture, mainly for biomass and the climate financing. We will, I'll give the floor to Oli. During this section, we'll have three presenters. It's going to be Vanessa Cabanelas from Justicia Ambiental in Mozambique. Her article and her presentations called Community Struggle Against Eucalyptus Plantations for Pulp and Paper. We'll then have Franz Howell and Sally Clark from Biofuel Watch in the UK, uh, subsidizing the world's largest biomass power station. And first we'll have Oliver Munion from GFC based in Portugal on the corporate capture of climate finance. So Oli, over to you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Isis, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to do a, a brief introduction to the next two speakers, basically, uh, but to introduce uh, really what's the second half uh, of our new report, uh, which focuses on uh, the, the, the climate and forestry policy making arena. Um, so if I can just share my screen. Um, so one of the uh, a small infographic in our report, which, which hopefully you've seen already, um, just looks at some of the, the processes that we've tried to, to tease out um, by which corporate capture is, is happening. Uh, and then the perverse incentives and the, all of the subsidies that we've been hearing about uh, so far for livestock are the result from this corporate capture. And then of course, how that in turn uh, is, is really you know, a barrier to reform those subsidies, but also to, to the adequate uh, you know, protection for, for forests and biodiversity and of course, um, uh, communities and, and, and other right, rights holders. So we've tried to, you know, go into as much detail as possible about what these actual processes are. And so um, two of the, the articles that I would have been most uh, involved in, um, they look at uh, international climate finance um, and also uh, a specific example from uh, Portugal uh, of our, pulp and, our main pulp and paper company, which is which is also very linked to what's going on in Mozambique. So uh, yeah, this is uh, an intentionally messy infographic. Uh, don't worry about it too much, but it's um, uh, you know meant to show the sort of very tangled web of interactions that occur uh, between all of these different processes, uh, whether they're on the international level uh, or on the national level, or on, on the regional level even, uh, and how they interact in the different companies and private sector actors that are. The directly um, benefiting from it. Um, so, uh, you know, in our, our example that we give of, of, of international climate finance, first of all, um, and how that's being captured and, there, and then funding, you know, being directed into, into private interests. Um, we, we've got three main examples uh, in the report of this happening. Um, so, for example, uh, first of all, the, the Albara Fund, uh, which we've talked about uh, in the past, and of course, um, uh, lots of our, our, our allies and members have also uh, campaigned with us on this, uh, you know, such as through the, the, the Clara group and of course, uh, well, Rainforest Movement has also been campaigning on this issue. Um, so for our borough fund, the top one, um, this, is, this is a very recent example of, uh, of, of what's considered a private sector project uh, within the Green Climate Fund, um, which is of, of course the, the, the UN's uh, main climate finance mechanism at the moment. And it's an example of where the Green Climate Fund has basically bought a $25 million uh, equity stake uh, into it. Um, and so because it's equity, it's, it's, it's like they, you know, they're owning a part of the fund. It's, it's an investment in the fund rather than like a grant or a loan or, or anything like that. Um, and so for us, this is emblematic of the direction that um, climate finance is, is heading in. So rather than, you know, directly supporting, uh, you know, 
good projects or projects that we would see as being beneficial to, to climate mitigation, what they're trying to do is, is leverage as much private sector funds as possible. Uh, um, and therefore, you know, the creation of all of these really um, opaque uh, financial instruments, there's so many different names and uh, new and ingenious ways of, of moving money about. Um, but the Abara Fund we see is really uh, the direction of things to come. Um, and although it's, it's pitched as a, as a private sector project, uh, in actual fact, it's, it's pretty much all public money behind it. Um, so it's public money being funneled into uh, a commercial plantation project. So what the Alboro Fund does is it takes this public money that it's receiving, and then it in turn invests in uh, a portfolio, a whole range of, um, of, of plantation investments, basically. So the, the two main ones that it's uh, looking for approval for at the moment uh, are in Ghana and Sierra Leone. Uh, and in Paraguay, uh, and as you might expect, they're almost entirely based around commercial eucalyptus plantations. Um, so, as well as as you know, very much questioning any any potential climate benefits um, from this. You know, most of the evidence shows that, uh, that there's no climate benefits from from tree plantations. Uh, there's also all of the impacts on communities that come with extensive uh, eucalyptus plantations, from the drying up of water resources. Uh, the loss of food sovereignty, the loss of access to land, uh, specific in, uh, gender differentiated impacts, impacts on women, impacts on the most vulnerable in, in societies. So that's why we think it's particularly important to, to focus on, you know, this particular example um, and try to stop that, you know, what, what will be a growing trend. So the next uh, example that we look at as well and have looked at in, in, a, in a lot of detail over the past year, uh, is the support that the iron and steel industry in Brazil is receiving, uh, again, from climate finance mechanisms. Um, so, so the example there of uh, ArcelorMittal, uh, so that's one of the world's biggest um, steel producing companies, um, if not the biggest. Um, and it's one of four companies that's being directly subsidized uh, in Minas Gerais in, in Brazil uh, to produce charcoal from eucalyptus plantations uh, instead of you know the other ways that they produce steel, but usually based around coal. And so the iron and steel industry in Brazil is uh, is pretty unique in that respect because of how much charcoal uh, is used in these processes. Uh, and essentially, what the the, the Global Environment Facility uh, and uh, the United Develop United Nations Development Program are doing is directly subsidizing four companies, which in our opinion have very very dodgy track records. Um, to, to basically develop the this, this sustain, so-called sustainable supply chain uh, of charcoal so that their business can continue uh, without having to make any of the you know, changes that we might expect or need uh, given the dire situation uh, you know, uh, with, climate, with climate change and of course the, the contribution of that uh, by the, the iron and steel industry. So another example that we look at is, is Red Plus uh, and actually um, you know, offsetting and, and, and carbon, carbon crediting in general, um, because, you know, particularly with some red projects where um, members of the fossil fuel industry, like uh, Shell, and there's lots of other examples, they're increasingly turning to offsetting projects, to tree plantation projects, as a way uh, to be able to say that they're removing carbon from the atmosphere and therefore allowing them to keep uh, emitting it. Um, so, th yeah, those are the, the, the three main examples that we look at from a climate finance perspective um, and of course there's much more detail about this in um, in the articles and so segueing on from that uh, looking and looking more at the sort of na national policy processes now although of course these are both also very influenced by what's going on internationally um, more specifically the two examples of uh, you know they're, they're really good examples actually of, of how corporate capture directly leads to to incentives and this is the navigator company in Portugal, um, which owns Porto de Mozambique, and we'll hear from Vanessa about um, that next. And then, of course, Drax in the UK, um, which used to be the UK's biggest coal-fired power station and is now, of course, the world's biggest um, biomass power station. So uh, <laughs> to start talking about the, the Navigator company, I'll, I'll tell you a personal story. Um, so uh, th this used to be where I lived uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago. Uh, and so my partner and I were, were living in this caravan as we rebuilt an old stone house and it was a small farm and uh, we were growing stuff. You can see the, the tomatoes growing there and, um, you know, trying to live in as low impact way as possible. Um, but unfortunately, in, in 2017, in October, uh, a large fire um, came through and as you can see, 
uh, pretty much destroyed uh, everything. So uh, it wasn't it wasn't just Arsenal Farm that was affected. Um, large large areas of, of central and northern Portugal were. Um, so yeah, this is just a photo of me looking out over the the charred landscape of what used to be our our terraces of olive trees and um, where we had animals and, and food growing and stuff like that. Um, 2017, I'm, I'm sure many of you um, heard about it in the news at the time, but it was, uh, it, was, it was really significant in Portugal because of the fires. Um, so there were two main mega fire events, uh, one right at the start of what we would consider the fire season, uh, although much earlier than normal in June, and the other one six months later in October. So that year, the fire season was basically um, six months long. Um, and it was, it was, you know, a lot of people predicted that Portugal was headed for some pretty catastrophic fire events um, because of years and years of, uh, of sort of neglect of the rural areas and of course the constant march and expansion of, um, of plantations, uh, which used to be mostly pine, but now increasingly is, is mostly eucalyptus for the pulp and paper industry, um, mostly. Uh, and so 2017 was a really hot year. Uh, it was a really bad drought year, and it was almost like the the conditions there were perfect for for these mega fire events, which were the worst uh, in in living memory at least. Uh, 155 people died in total over the year, uh, and about half a million hectares um, were burnt. Uh, burned. Uh, and you can you can sort of see in the photo there in the background eucalyptus plantations. And so this is the problem for a lot of rural communities in Portugal is that they are to a large extent surrounded by eucalyptus and it's very close to them uh, and uh, often it's very poorly managed as well. So these these weren't uh, managed by the big pulp and paper companies. These were, you know, private individuals that thought that, you know, the only way they could actually make money off their land was through planting eucalyptus trees, but then that they would sell uh, to the pulp and paper industry. So, you know, whether these plantations are directly managed by the industry or not, um, you know, the industry is largely responsible for the fact that they are there and the situation that they're in. Um, so this photo was taken by, by uh, Domingos, who works for uh, one of our member groups in Portugal, um, Quercus. And so he took this uh, shortly after the, the June fire, I think it was, um, quite close to where, where I was living at the time. Uh, and you can, you can see there uh, that it's, it's pretty much all eucalyptus trees, um, as far as the eye can see. Um, and so the metaphor that, that I like to use uh, in this situation is that when you have these extensive, really extensive areas of, uh, of monoculture, uh, generally poorly managed, um, often a very similar age, uh, basically what you've done is created a race course for fire. Um, so, uh, you know, eucalyptus in particular are very, very flammable, is a very flammable species. And once you have a fire started and there's a bit of wind, it's basically impossible to stop these fires and they move through the landscape at uh, an incredible rate. Um, and so, for example, the, the fire that, that eventually um, burnt our place down in, in 2017, um, I think we'd, we'd been to the top of the hill the day before and saw that there was a fire, I don't know what it was, 20 or 30 kilometers away. And we thought, that's okay, that's quite far away. You know, maybe we need to worry about it tomorrow, but not tonight. But then a couple of hours later, we were woken up with the fire at the door basically and it had just gone through the landscape at such such uh, uh, an incredible rate. Um, so why, why is this happening? Uh, so the Navigator company um, is actually it's Europe's biggest producer of pulp and paper uh, and not coincidentally uh, Portugal also has the highest proportion of eucalyptus uh, anywhere in the world. It's, it's a very small country um, but Proportionally, there's an awful lot of eucalyptus, uh, particularly in, in the northern and, and central regions of the country. So the Navigator Company, uh, for, for years and years now, um, has exerted a really, really massive influence over, um, over decision makers, over politics in Portugal. Um, so it's got uh, vast lobbying power, huge public relations operations, and the support of a very powerful industry lobby group, um, of which it's the, the main actor, uh, which is called SELPA. And so just some of the examples of, of ways that it's wielded its influence. Uh, the former president um, of uh, the Navigator before he died recently was considered the 19th most powerful person in the country. I think he was also the ninth richest person in the country. Um, he gave, uh, he financed political campaigns of, of presidents in particular and giving sort of the maximum that he was allowed to. Uh, the Navigator company um, also went in for quite heavy handed 
lobbying tactics. So, for example, at one point it threatened to pull all of its investments out of the country if it didn't get um, what it wanted, which was essentially uh, the deregulation of the industry or the liberalization of, of where eucalyptus could be planted. Uh, and also significantly, there was a revolving door and, and still exists, a revolving door between government uh, and the pulp paper and industry, navigator in particular, um, whereby uh, even up to uh, the extent of um, former uh, Secretary of State for Forest and Development, being a former employee of a uh, company that's very involved in the pulp and paper sector, going back and forth in that role. O secretário de Estado Estadual Nacional, ele tem uma relação muito grande com a Navigator Company e tem estado no governo e na Navigator Company em diversos vários anos. Um outro was appointed the president of the Rural Fire Management Program that was supposed to prevent Sorry, Oli? such disasters from happening again. Sorry, am I going over my time? Oli? Can you hear me? There's a problem with interpretation. Okay. In the English in the English channel, we're listening to the Portuguese. I don't know if this can be easily fixed. Um, I'm not sure. Hopefully, that's a, um, an easy one to solve. Okay, okay, they tell me that it's been fixed. Sorry, Oli, please carry okay. on, sorry. No worries, sorry, I thought you were telling me I was going over my time. I probably am as well. Um, okay, so yeah, we've looked at, you know, some of the ways that they're able to influence decision-making um, in Portugal. Uh, and obviously this is really significant as we'll hear next from, uh, from Vanessa, because it's not just in Portugal that these impacts are felt, um, but also of course in, uh, in Mozambique, which is a former um, colony of Portugal. Um, yeah, so what are the kinds of access to support that uh, the different regions of the European Union? The industry of paper and cellulose that they can access is a form of support, probably, is the fact that the industry has just been systematically. The most important is that the industry has. There's just been a total lack of management of, of rural areas and forest areas and plantation areas uh, in Portugal. So that sort of, you know. <laughs> void that's been left by any sort of uh, government or state processes just gets filled by um, uh, by the pulp and paper industry and therefore by their plantations. Um, so that's that's really significant. They have literally been able to do what, whatever they want for a long time. Uh, and then of course there's lots of money available either from Portugal or from the EU uh, to, to finance these operations. So also in 2017, of course, when the bad fires were, uh, you know, millions of euros were made available to increase productivity of plantations, uh, to re re replant uh, places where they, you know, they'd already been cut three or four times. Uh, and then, of course, since the fires, there's been also a lot of money for uh, you know, rural development and for resilience and for recovery that the industry has been lobbying hard to get its hands on. Uh, and you know, there's, there's a list of them here and there's more in the, in, in the article as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, there's other forms of subsidy. So, for example, the EIB, the, the European Investment Bank, sí, uh, given loans to navigate company eight times in recent years. Uh, and the most recent one uh, was almost 30 million euros uh, for a new biomass boiler uh, at one of their pulp mills. Uh, of course, the myth that, that, that bioenergy and burning biomass in particular is, um, is, is carbon neutral, the, you know, the reason for that finance. Uh, and then on top of that, they're also the, the biggest uh, biomass burner in Portugal. So they produce a, a significant amount of electricity that gets exported to the grid uh, for which they are they're directly subsidized by the state. Well, they're subsidized by through the increased bills that we pay as, uh, as bill payers. Um, so just to end, uh, I, I just wanted to draw your attention to uh, this fantastic book. I think uh, Paulo, one of the authors is, is in attendance today. Um, which is great. Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, this, it's in Portuguese. Uh, the book is called Portugal in Flames, um, how, uh, how to Save Portugal's Forests. Um, and uh, the English translation is as follows. So in the last few decades, the influence of the pulp and paper industry over political decisions and forestry in general has become totally dominant, going beyond influence in the corridors of power and into direct governance. The revolving door between the republic and private spheres in the forestry sector is another example of the dramatic conflict of interests that exist, causing great loss to the country and enormous benefits to the industry. 
Um, so yeah, that, that sums it up uh, far better than I can. Um, and although it's in Portuguese, I highly recommend that book as a resource. Uh, it's also listed in the references in, um, uh, in the article. Um, so yes, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, Vanessa then from Justice Ambiental in um, Mozambique to tell us about what's going on there. Thank you, Oli. Thank you, Global Forest Coalition, for the invitation. Uh, I will also do my presentation in Portuguese, if that's OK. Just a second, so I try to share my screen with you. Uh, o Oli esteve a apresentar a Navigator Company e, e felizmente o fez muito bem feito porque já não precisamos de falar desta empresa que é uh, uma, das principais, uma das principais acionistas da Porto Cell em Moçambique. A Porto Cell também, também tem uh, participação do IFC. Portanto, Porto tem... Cell also has participation in the International Finance Corporation of the World Bank. Porto Cell was built in 20, uh, 2009 by the Navigator Company. It was built in 2009 by the Navigator Company. And on that year, the government gave them the ownership of 173,000 actors in Zambezia and Mulevala and Namahoy. In 2018, 2011, they gave an additional 183,000 hectares in Minica, Badue, Manica, Muzare, Gondola, and Susundinga. Uh, they, at the moment, have the ownership of 356,000 hectares of land. And starting in 2010, they have received the authorization to use uh, up to 2019-2021 ownership. In Zambezia, they have 13,000 people and that uh, have been um, dislodged from their homes. And this land was not free, uh, contrary to what is talked by Porto Cell. This land was uh, owned by these families. In Zambezia and Pamikam, agriculture is the main uh, issue that has been worked with the people. And it's a family agricultural business. 24,000 uh, families. Are, they live specifically from the land and they practice an agriculture that is very rudimental and their lands are around one to five hectares. So they depend highly on the land. The process that Porto Sao has been doing is not of public domain and a lot of the land that Porto Sao has been using is owned by these families. In Mozambique, the land is owned by the government, but the local communities are protected. So their ownership is protected by the government. There is a law that predicts that they, that these lands are owners and they can use these lands. When this, when Porto Cell's process started in Mozambique, uh, soon after this, they started to receive complaints from the community because uh, Porto Cell had already been in Zambezia and they have been monitoring the forest and other areas. They have been showing some problems specifically in Zambezia where everything started. One of the members of the community told in a meeting that the uh, manager of the land forbidden, 
forbid the the community to uh, speak their opinion about Porto Stel and tell them to stay quiet. That's how they talk to the community when they have the opportunity. And this talk is one of the requisites for them to have ownership of the land. Porto Sao needs to have uh, a conversation with the communities and have the approval of these communities. So the communities have to approve their land to Porto Sao. This is the example of one of these meetings with the community. This was one of the first uh, areas where Porto Sao started their plantations. Uh, in 2019, things started. In 2011, we had the information that the partners of the land in that specific community in Sokodim, they were forced to give their lands to a Portuguese company. They were being forced by the local government uh, and they had these promises of jobs, schools, a better life, and other benefits to the community as a whole. In 2011, the environmental justice started to investigate these, ca these cases to see what was happening. And all the things that the complaints that were made by the community, they were rebuked by the company. Porto Sao never admitted any sort of problems uh, within the land. And they denied all the allegations. The IFC uh, owned now 20% of Porto Sao. So now they are part of the international bank, the World Bank. And this, they started becoming as a, an example from how to uh, own the land, negotiate with the community and use it. In 2016, the uh, program of, of forest investment wanted to protect 40,000 hectares. Uh, they protected the plantation of 40,000 hectares. And they had the support from the uh, Mozambican uh, group, government. Justice um, Ambiental, they uh, published a report in 2016 that investigated several communities. They interviewed members of the community. And this report showed a general dissatisfaction within the communities. There were, of course, some people that had jobs, leaders that profited from getting a new bike. And, but generally, the benefits that the community have seen are minimal and the community is dissatisfied. Specifically, the communities where Porto Cell has already started acting. They have a very extensive land, but they still haven't planted in all their land. So although they have consulted the community, which is a prerequisite by law, most of the leaders, the community leaders who we have spoken, they told us several part of what was discussed in these meetings. It's important that these consults, they are widely, badly discussed. We were able to, to participate in these meetings, you have to be from the government, the Porto Cell, or the leaders and the influential people in the community. Basically, the ones who talk are the influential ones, the others just listen. It's important to notice that these consultation, specifically the ones by Porto Cell, were made in Portuguese. Although in Mozambique, Portuguese is the is the main language. There are several local languages and most of these, some of these communities, they don't understand uh, Portu the Portuguese. The local communities, they also don't know the procedures about these consultations. 
patients. Qual é de facto and, o seu and where they are? nestas consultas? A grande... What is their actual não, power não, não in tenho... these consultations? Pode dizer que não quer. Pode dizer que realmente não Most quer. Most of them esta, have no idea dizer. that they cannot Portanto, esta um, nunca, participate, nunca. that they don't want that investment Quando in their land. However, claro, this is never considered já because when são... they are standing Portanto, side by side with a... the government and they already have the, um, the project. So the project to get to that point of the consultation, it has been approved by the government. So the local, gov the local authorities, they aren't going to question what has been blessed by the, the national government. So there isn't in fact uh, an actual consultation. So there is a lack of comprehension by the people in these consultations. And what is actually being discussed is still a mystery. They weren't presented to the local communities. And in the large scale monoculture of eucalyptus, practically there are a few areas planted in this way, and in these rural communities, they didn't know even what an eucalyptus plant was. So they don't, didn't know the impacts of these plantations in their reality and their lives. The negotiations for lands after uh, being attributed through a provisory act by the central government to the portocell, the portocell, even though were uh, negotiate to each one of the members of the community to take the lands that belong to each one of them. So this negotiation processes was individual with each family, only with the owner. And we have copies of the land uh, giving uh, in exchange of a promise of employment or or actually a priority of employment, uh, better life conditions and priority and the access to the benefits of social benefits by Potsal. So the communities gave practically all their lands. Elis Fisser and Kasik, they did almost 4,000 agreements about lands elaborated by the portal, signed by the members of the community and with participation of local leaders and government, they have not uh, any value for Mozambican legislation because they don't have any uh, sense in the legislation because they negotiate with the community, but actually the ownership of the lands belongs to the government. The people that gave uh, their lands, they didn't receive basically any nothing. Uh, they have their mashambas uh, for the clearance of the mashambas of their fields, their farms. They received uh, 1,500 uh, local currency, which is about one euro. And it's not like it's not even 10 euros, it's about two euros. And it's not a payment for their land, but in Mozambique, the land belongs to the government. So it's an agreement, but there is not a payment. So the land, it's not paid. They didn't bought the lands. So they gave the lands and didn't receive anything in exchange. This is one of the, this is a, a man in the Namahoi community in Motuali, I think, that gave his land and signed an agreement. And he is uh, very angry because he was uh, taken out from his land. And this agreement was signed six years ago, close to 2014, but he didn't receive anything. His life is not better. This is his house and he doesn't have a job in Porto. His life didn't get better. He haven't seen any benefit from this social projects that Porto Cell 
speak about large parts of the areas that are occupied by port cell and given to port cell. Uh, they are occupied by eucalyptus plantation. They are productive areas. Uh, they are not marginal areas, lands. So these plantations uh, compete directly with food production. And when they don't compete with food production, they are occupied by savanna and native vegetation. And uh, through the clearance of native vegetation, they plant a monoculture, large-scale monoculture. And it has been used a lot this argument, and calling these plantations plantations and sus argumentos son que reducen el cambio climático y están llamando estas plantaciones eh, diciendo que van que van a que van a dar en reversa los procesos climáticos el gobierno ha sido ha mostrado una total competencia al, al tratar con esta compañía para devolver la tierra a, los, a, sus, a, a las comunidades. Porque muchas de estas, de estas tierras este, son, están cerca a caminos, cerca a agua. Esa era una por una... Our community uh, people. What facilitated Portugal, uh, into the communities was the promise of employment. Uh, it's supposed that Porto Cell will bring jobs to the communities for people out of Mozambique. It might be difficult to perceive how poor and vulnerable are these communities. They don't have health uh, conditions or uh, or education, so any improvement in those conditions, any promise is very well received. And with those promises, they were convinced of giving their lands. In 2019, when Porto Sale arrived to Mozambique, they were talking about 7,500 jobs for the community members, it's easy to believe that the 7,500 emplois. Alors, the community cell had a total of 250 collaborators, directly and directly. So, these 250, we have collaborators direct and we have others who are not direct. We don't know until now. So, not even those collaborators are directly related to Porto Cell. We don't know the amount of workers that work or that collaborate to Porto Cell. And also, it's important to question the kind of job that Portugal is offering for the community members. What are the payments, the, condi the shop conditions? And the payments are usually below 4,000 local currency that are not enough for a family to survive for a month. So with those salaries, they cannot even feed their families. Uh, Porto Sale always deny that they uh, made promises of improvements in life conditions. They say they didn't do that promises. But in close provinces and in different communities that don't communicate among each other, and they are far away, but the, all these communities speaks about the same promises on the same way, the same processes. So clearly the promises were made and the members of the community uh, were convinced to believe that there was uh, improvements in their lives, that there would be. He said that nothing changed in Apala. We are crying because they take our lands. They promised school, we didn't see. They promised hospital, we didn't see. They promised jobs, we didn't see. We are nervous because nothing changed the improved life that they promised we didn't see. 
but shall represent the time. Los representantes ante los ante el gobierno de Mozambique. Que se chama aqui de reflorestamento, mas que eu tenho uma, uma grande dificuldade em chamar de reflorestamento, porque é basicamente de plantação de eucaliptos. Um, e faz parte desta estratégia no âmbito de um processo de, de, de mitigação dos impactos das mudanças climáticas. Portanto, mais uma outra grande mentira para, para minimizar os impactos destas plantações. Para minimizar os impactos essas irregularidades, há imensa insatisfação por parte das comunidades. Las, las irregularidades que, que han habido con, eh, han generado una cierta cierto grado de conflictos con la tierra. Y Porto Cel ainda estava no início do seu processo. Debido a que Porto Cel comunitarios até hoje continuam a logrado al Sigue con sus, con sus proyectos, pero los miembros de las comunidades siguen ignorados. En este momento, ellos conocen los impactos sociales. En este momento, existe impacto social, impacto ambiental, que nadie, del que nadie se está haciendo cargo. Así que las comunidades atribuyen todos estos impactos, especialmente las especies de agua, las Las big to the part cell, like the lack of rain and climate change. Uh, they don't know about the amount of jobs promised or about what kind of changes they can expect for their lives. This is an example of how close we are. Un minuto más, por favor, para poder pasar los dos presentadores que faltan. Si puedes concluir. Gracias. Just one minute for the next two presentators. This image shows the proximity of the plantations from the houses, and this is visible also the proximity with rivers that are used by these communities and streams. And they do a huge propaganda about transparency in their company and concern about environment, but this is extremely false. From 2011, they were, uh, they are unable to provide documents about transparency and other processes from the Porto Sol. Once again, the Porto Sol rejects uh, giving, presenting documents and we invited members of the of the of the company to join the community members, but they don't. Uh, they uh, always uh, reject this kind of meetings. So there are a lot of documents to analyze, but we needed to appeal to the national government to force them to get access to those documents from the Supreme Court of Mozambique. Uh, we got the this, those documents. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for using more time that, than need. Vanessa, no, that, that was brilliant. Um, um, really useful information here. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, yep, yeah, so to, to, to finish, um, uh, well, a last but one presentation because we'll hear from um, from Simone Nevera just at the end as well. Uh, but now I'd like to hand over to Sally and to Fran uh, from Biofuel Watch uh, for the final presentation. Over to you. Uh, yeah, hi, hi everyone. Um, so Sally and I will be sharing this presentation and Sally is sharing her screen. Um, we're both from Biofuel Watch. We're a really small NGO in the US and UK, uh, highlighting the impacts of large scale biomass. Um, uh, and uh, this presentation focuses on uh, Drax Power Station, uh, which is, uh, do you want to go to the next slide, Sally? Um, which is uh, formerly the largest coal-fired power station in the UK um, and now the largest biomass power station 
uh, it, uh, it, it, it converted from burning coal to burning biomass, and it's uh, still the single largest source of CO2 in the UK. And um, we wanted to focus on Drax because uh, although it's one of the largest polluters in the UK, it receives over two million pounds in renewable energy subsidies every single day, as well as recently having been given um, millions of pounds from the government for uh, developing carbon uh, bio, bio energy with carbon capture and storage, which is uh, unproven and potentially really dangerous technology. Um, so we decided to uh, have have a look uh, in in more detail into Drax's various corporate capture techniques. Um, do you want to move to the next slide? Um, and we discovered that there, there were even more actually uh, than, than we were expecting. Uh, Drax has very privileged access to decision makers. Um, these are a couple of images of Drax's trains uh, that go from uh, Liverpool and from Immingham uh, ports where, where uh, wood pellets are uh, arrive when, when they're imported to the UK and they get taken on these trains to Drax and they have slogans on them like powering tomorrow and carrying sustainable biomass for cost-effective renewable power um, and that's that's the kind of language that Drax uses. Um, so in terms of the research we did uh, I won't go into detail about all of it but it's all in the article uh, uh, published by Global Forest Coalition. Um, so we discovered that um, since 2012, uh, Drax had attended over 50 meetings with government ministers, including quite a lot in the last year about uh, what it calls a, a building back better and a green recovery from coronavirus as well as inviting both UK ministers and foreign politicians to look around the power station. And we saw a lot of articles uh, in the local media where Drax is based of uh, different uh, politicians and, uh, and uh, visiting uh, MPs all like photographed at Drax wearing a hard hat and a high vis. And, um, We've done some freedom of information requests to find out more information about uh, what, what was being discussed at these meetings, which um, Sally might be able to talk, talk about a bit more. Uh, we also looked at lobby groups that Drax is a member of, such as the Renewable Energy Association, which, although it has that name with renewable energy in the title, a lot of the work it does is about promoting biomass and a lot of its members are, um, are fossil fuel companies that do a little bit of work in renewables. So that was quite interesting. Um, also sponsorship of events like they, they uh, Drax was a major sponsor and speaker at an event last year called the Net Zero Festival. Um, uh, it was organized by Business Green, which is like a, um, a kind of media platform for what are meant to be green business initiatives. Um, other sponsors of that were uh, Heathrow um, and Shell, so you can get a bit of an idea of what kinds of things were being talked about just from those, those few headline speakers. Um, and also attending climate summits. So for example, at the COP25 summit in Madrid, uh, Drax made a big announcement about its intention to become a carbon negative power station and um, uh, getting to the carbono. these events gives a, a, a big audience. Um, and yes, so events have an audience very grande. Outra coisa que a gente encontrou. Nós vamos identificar na pesquisa que há 
euh, une présence de drag. The Committee on Climate Change, which is a body that advises the government about climate change. And what's interesting there is that uh, Drax is the only corporation that's represented on, on that body. All the other members are um, uh, their academics or their people who you, you might expect uh, could possibly have a, a bit of a more balanced view. But then we also got somebody from a fossil fuel and biomass company directly advising the government on, on climate change. And that maybe explains a bit of the reason why the UK government is so keen to be pushing bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, for example, rather than doing anything to actually reduce our carbon emissions. Um, and another of the really significant examples was uh, Trax is a, a member of the uh, Sustainable Biomass Program. So that's a really uh, significant example of, uh, of a company essentially marking its own homework. And uh, while, while, uh, while, while Drax is um, making money out of the biomass industry, it's also uh, uh, got, uh, got a lot of influence over this sustainability standard that, um, that uh, that give, gives it a label that says it's green and sustainable. So what we're seeing again and again here is uh, greenwashing of terms. So uh, do you want to move to the next slide, Sally? Um, so the same that we've been seeing the same terms again and again, sustainable biomass, net zero, negative emissions, um, on the cover of Drax's annual report last year, it said uh, it said uh, creating a zero carbon, lower cost energy future. And most recently, Drax and other companies have uh, captured the term "build back better," uh, meaning uh, to have a, a more just and green recovery from the coronavirus pandemic, and um, that. Obviously, when climate campaigners first started using the term build back better, um, something like a, a, a major uh, biomass uh, project and carbon capture and storage weren't what any of us were thinking about. Um, so, um, yeah, so when, when we see terms like this, obviously we need to look at who's using them and what they actually mean. Uh, Drax almost never just says biomass, it always says sustainable biomass on all of its public communications. And um, going back to the um, uh, uh, Beck's bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, uh, research that it's trying to get funding for at the moment, while it's very unlikely that Drax and any of the companies it's collaborating with are going to be able to capture and store anything like the amount of carbon they're claiming to, the main risk is that all the this vast amount of public money will keep on and on being spent on uh, biomass burning in general and uh, these techno-fix schemes that um, first of all, don't actually store any carbon, and second, even if they did, that's ignoring all the other existing impacts of bioenergy on forests and communities. Um, so that's why it's important. And now I'll hand over to Sally to um, do the second half. Thank you very much, Fran. So how can we challenge Drax's corporate capture and its claims that it is powering tomorrow with sustainable biomass when much of the wood that it burns comes from clear felled forests like we can see in the picture in the southern USA, Canada and Europe? Well, in order to challenge Drax's political influence and its huge subsidies in the UK, Biofuel Watch is very excited to be part of a new coalition campaign with American environmental organizations 
called Cut Carbon, Not Forests. We are asking members of the UK Parliament to protect forests around the world by transferring over £1 billion in UK renewable subsidies from tree burning power stations like Drax to genuinely renewable wind, wave and solar power. And if you live in the UK, you can find out more about the campaign and take action with this link. We are also working with supportive members of parliament who are questioning the UK government subsidies for biomass burning. And as Fran said, we are trying to find out more about what Drax is doing behind the scenes and its links to government through freedom of information requests. Another key thing that we're doing is working with campaigners in the UK and around the world to raise more awareness about Drax's greenwashing and to highlight the devastating impacts of Drax's tree burning on forests, wildlife, communities and the climate. And last year, we worked with amazing activists in the UK to organize Axe Drax protests online and people took pictures with trees and messages like Axe Drax, not trees. We also helped to organize socially distanced protests to call for an end to Drax's trains of destruction. And these are the enormous trains that Drax uses to transport millions of tons of wood pellets from Clearfeld American forests across the north of England to burn in Drax. And these are just some of the pictures of these protests last year. We are now also part oops, sorry, of another coalition with groups like 350.org, Friends of the Earth Scotland and the UK Youth Climate Coalition, and it's called Kick Polluters Out. And we're trying to keep Drax and other big polluters out of the UN COP26 Climate Summit. And as part of the campaign, we have some UK polluter awards, which are open to everyone around the world. And we would love it if you would like to vote for the UK's biggest polluters. We're very excited that Drax is nominated for three awards for its greenwashing, for its net zero promises, and for its lifetime achievement as the UK's biggest polluter and the world's biggest tree burner. So these are just some of the ways that we can all take action and start to break the vicious cycle of corporate capture by the world's biggest polluters. By investigating companies, by contacting our political representatives, and by raising public awareness of forest destruction in the media and on social media, we can really start to put pressure on governments and their claims that they are taking urgent climate action while they are giving huge subsidies to polluters like Drax. And it is starting to make a difference. For example, last week, the Guardian newspaper in the UK published an investigation into the destruction of forests in Estonia in order to supply biomass to power stations like Drax. And this article was shared on Twitter by Greta Thunberg. So it reached a huge international audience. And it's through campaigns, media organizations media investigations and social media that the issue of forest destruction for the biomass industry is starting to reach a wider audience around the world. And more and more people are challenging the greenwashing claims from companies like Drax that burning trees and power stations is carbon neutral or a renewable alternative to fossil fuels. There are also lots of things that we can do as individuals to take action. As well as the Cut Carbon Not Forest campaign in the UK, there's a petition to call on EU leaders to protect forests and not burn them for energy. It's also extremely important to connect with other groups and campaigners around the world so that we can support each other and especially support the frontline communities who are facing forest destruction. 
And social media is a great way that we can do this. For example, in November last year, there was an International Day of Action on Forest Biomass Energy to raise awareness of the destruction of forests in Estonia and Latvia in order to supply wood to burn in racks and other power stations. And the online action was taken by groups around the world, including in Europe, America and in Australia. Another great way that we can all take action is to follow groups like the Global Forest Coalition, the Environmental Paper Network, Biofuel Watch, the Red Monitor, the Dogwood Alliance. They're all groups who support frontline communities and help them to protect their forests. And with COP26 due to take place in November this year, another amazing coalition that we can all support is the COP26 Civil Society Coalition, which is made up of hundreds of campaigners and frontline community activists from around the world. And this coalition is campaigning for climate, environmental and social justice before, during and after COP26. There is also a petition to try and keep drags and other big polluters out of COP26. And there's a link to this petition to the UK government in this slide. There's also a video that we can share, which is exposing some of the net zero greenwashing by Drax and other huge polluters. By joining together like this, we really can make a positive difference for forests, wildlife, communities and the climate. And I'd like to finish with this quote from a paper called The Biomass Delusion, which has been signed by over 120 environmental groups. Subsidies for forest biomass energy must be eliminated. Protecting and restoring the world's forests is a climate change solution. Burning them is not. Thank you so much to Global Forest Coalition for inviting us and a huge thank you for listening to our presentation. If you would like to keep in touch with Biofuel Watch, we would love to hear from you. We have a newsletter that you can sign up for and the links at the bottom of the page. And we also have the details for our website, email and social media. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis and Sally, for such an interesting presentation. Um, due to time constraints, well, it seems there are no more questions. We had a couple of questions, both for Vanessa's presentation and Francis and Sally's presentation, but they, they were answered during the presentation itself. So we won't, uh, if there are any other questions for Vanessa or Francis and Sally, please type them down right away. Uh, we will continue with Simona Lovera. She's going to give us some concluding remarks of uh, this webinar and um, we'll finalize afterwards. Thanks, Simona. Thank you very much. I will try to be brief. I, I can be well understood. Um, I think that after the other presentations and the additional case studies in the report, there's only one conclusion possible, which is that perverse incentives in all their forms need to be phased out as soon as possible. Preferably actually the coming months so that we can free up funds for health care, social care and all the very badly needed COVID and post-COVID responses. Most heads of states and other parts powerful people in the sustainable development sector have actually already accepted this conclusion. If you see the summits that took place last week, then many of them expressed their strong support for the phasing out of perverse incentives and for the implementation of the so-called AITSI targets of the Convention on Biodiversity that says that all uh, perverse incentives uh, that harm biodiversity should actually be have, have been eliminated by last December. So I will be, focus my brief conclusion recommendations, which are partly based on my own social science research, on the question why this elimination is not happening. I think it can be concluded from the case studies that the main reason is corporate capture, as mentioned by many, in all its obvious and more hidden form, forms like corruption, nepotism, obvious conflicts of interest are broadly acknowledged to be immoral. But I would highlight that fully legal forms of corporate capture, like blended finance, are not that ethical either. 
Often discussions about corporate capture classify corporations into bad corporations like fossil fuels and good corporations that are then you know, allowed to participate in policy making. But we cannot blame specific number of corporations themselves for this situation. They are merely instruments of a capitalist system which forces them to put their own commercial interest first, always. And this is not a matter of choice or even immorality. Their shareholders expect corporations to put their commercial interests first. In fact, corporations are legally, and perhaps even morally, obliged not to support any policymakers that would seriously harm their own long-term commercial interests. This obligation is inherent to the system of capitalism. So it's not corporations that are immoral, it's the capitalist system that is immoral and the governments that have embraced its capitalism as the main system of human governance. This capitalist system replaces public responsibilities, for example, for the conservation of forests and protection of climate, or for example, renewables, as Sally mentioned, for, uh, and which can be done through strict regulations that simply prohibit destructive activities and investments in such activities. This neoliberal market-based approaches that suggest corporations can take the lead in solving environmental challenges. Climate finance is a very clear example, as we already mentioned. Delivering the 100 billion US dollar per year was a clear promise in Paris by Northern governments for climate finance. And the fact that this responsibility was basically ducked these governments has then opened a, a big avenue for corporate capture of climate finance and thus climate and forest policy. So all sorts of blended finance instruments that promote false solutions that clearly benefit investors and other incorporations involved. I think the last case study make this very, very clear. This is often called eco-capitalism. Philanthrocapitalism, as highlighted in the report, by private corporate funded foundations is problematic in this respect as well, as it tends to promote a mix of private and public investments and interests. The Gates Foundation is a clear example of this, with part of its funding coming directly or indirectly, so Bill Gates personally, from the very companies that benefit from the policies the Gates Foundation promotes and funds including through, for example, the world's International Agricultural Resource Centers and more recently, the World's Health Organizations and its COVAX mechanism. And please note that social research has found the alignment of assumed public interest with private interest is often happening quite subtly. Many corporate executives and probably even many philanthropists sincerely believe there is an accidental convergence of their own private interest and the public interest. Investments and interest are inherently linked and we should su simply should not mix private and public interest, if only because large corporations tend to concentrate economic and political power, while groups like indigenous peoples and women tend to be both economically and politically marginalized. This link between economic and political power is another inherent phenomenon of a capitalist society. Capitalism is inherently about capital governing societies. Those who have more capital will always be more dominant in a capitalist society. So this is what transformative change should really be about, an end to capitalism. And it's very concerning that so many NGOs, civil society organizations, and, and, and that particularly NGOs, still hide or even oppose this agenda and continue to promote capitalist solutions to forest conservation, like Red Plus, reducing emissions from deforestation through payments for environmental services. That inherently, per definition, marginalize economically less powerful groups. One simply cannot defend the rights and needs of marginalized groups like women and indigenous peoples in an actual manner in a society that is dominated by those who have most capital. Happily, there are clear alternatives. As is already highlighted, forests do not grow on money. They do not necessarily need money. And many indigenous peoples, local communities and women's groups, including peasant groups, have proven to be able to build sustainable livelihoods without any dependence on foreign capital. And while some modest public support for such livelihoods, and especially the public services these people are entitled to, is very welcome, Policies like the recognition of forest governance rights have proven to be far more effective or beneficial, also from a fiscal perspective, than, for example, payments for environmental services. 
So my main recommendation is that powerful civil society organizations, including particularly NGOs and other Janine sustainable development policymakers, change the discourse of asking for more and more capital and thus capitalism. But start focusing on promoting Janine rights-based social policies that foster for community forest conservation initiatives by women and men and embrace human rights and equity rather than capital as the heart of our governance system. Thank you very much. And I hope there's maybe still some time for some last questions and discussion. Thank you, Simon. So yes, we still have five minutes. If someone has a pressing comment, pressing question, then it's the time to do so. Otherwise, we would just thank very much all the panelists or the attendees. Uh, thank you for showing up, for following the webinar. We hope uh, you can continue to follow the campaigns, join them and be actively supporting them through social media, uh, reading the materials, etc., etc. So yeah, it seems like it's the end. No Q&A? Nope. So thank you everyone. Thanks to the interpreters and thank you for being here. Have a nice day, evening, goodbye. Bye, thank you very much for organizing. Thank you, bye-bye. Very interesting, thank you.